Hello, everyone. My name is Joshua Oduga. I'm the Exhibitions and Public Programs Manager at Art and Practice. Thank you for joining us for this public program, Artist Talk, Devin B. Johnson. Devin B. Johnson is a painter originally from Los Angeles, currently based in Brooklyn. How you doing, Devin? Doing well. How are you doing, Joshua? Doing great. Great. Thank you for joining me um, in this program. And thank you for the conversations that we've been having over the past few weeks, kind of leading up to this. I'm really excited to explore your artwork. As I mentioned to you when we first met, I came across your artwork years ago, um, just like around Los Angeles. And ever since then, I've wanted to do something like this with you. I never thought it would happen here at Art and Practice, but I'm very glad to use this platform to share more information about the amazing work that you do. Um, so I think we're gonna do this program by sharing some images that you prepared. So yes. go ahead and share your sure. screen and then we can jump into that. Yeah, I mean, I want to first by saying thank you, Art and Practice, and thank you, Joshua. And, you know, for me, this is uh, an honor to be able to come to you all, to the public, to talk a bit about my practice, and especially coming from Art and Practice, being um, a staple as a nonprofit institution in Los Angeles, helping uh, the community at large there. So it, this is it's a great honor for me to share some of my thoughts to you all uh, this afternoon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for being with us, and I really appreciate what you just said. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into it. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, find my screen. All right, do you, do you see this, Joshua? Not yet. Not yet? Okay, let me go ahead. There we go. You see where we're at? Man, this, uh, here we go. Here we go. All right. So um, my name is Devin B. Johnson. Um, for, for those of you who are just meeting me for the first time today, um, I am from Los Angeles, California. I was born in March 4th, 1992. So I'm a Pisces uh, and near the monkey is what I read. Um, but uh, moving forward, you know, LA for me was where my roots kind of uh, were kind of st uh, stationed. Uh, I, my earlier part of my life, I lived in San Diego, where um, I was taken under close consideration and cl close nurturement with uh, underneath my nana and my papa. Um, and my brother and I, we had very, I would say, very potent foundational years living there in San Diego, where after school, um, I would go back home and I would you know, spend a lot of my time kind of drawing, looking at Bob Ross, looking at programs on uh, PBS or Discovery Kids. Um, and a lot of the creativity at the early age of, I would say, I don't know, five on to 29, it was kind of this, I guess, confusion or this curiosity that kind of just stuck, I guess, uh, through the whole course of my life. Um, and this is kind of why I guess I would say I'm an artist today is that I have this curiosity that is, that is in me that I can't necessarily get out of. And so I'm compelled with my ideas and my ambitions and my thoughts, maybe, maybe this thing called talent that I could maybe manifest some of the ideas of my mind to either paint or whatever material. Um, and so some of those things that, I, that I've, I've come to learn over the years, but um, it was something that I've always was on the money for. As a, as a young kid, I was always very sure that I wanted to be an artist, more or less. Um, my parents and my grandparents would always give me nurturing comments that, you know, this is something that I could potentially see for myself. And I know that's rare in a lot of cases. A lot of parents don't necessarily uh, see the benefits of their children exploring their nature or their natural capabilities or even their talents, right? whether it be the arts. Um, but my parents and my grandparents saw that it was something that it was in me and they did not want to, to cocoon me into a, into a person that I wasn't supposed to be. So they nurtured me into this, to this artist. And so I went to undergrad um, school at uh, Cal State Channel Islands, um, which is in Camarillo. And I went into uh, my first year of undergrad in 2010. Um, and it was there when I kind of picked up a little bit of the fundamentals of, of oil painting. Um, we took this uh, project where we looked at a lot of Italian uh, old painting, Renaissance painting, 
And I liked Caravaggio a lot. He was one of my favorite um, painters from the Baroque period because he, uh, he invoked a lot of drama and he evoked a lot of mood. Um, and, I, and I can feel that from the paintings. But as from this assignment, I remember we had to go into any type of painting that we liked and take a subsection, go into a close crop and, and, and kind of recreate that close crop out of oil in all the processes that we were told that the old masters um, did. So there was pencil, lawn drawing, getting the, the drawing, the composition straight on the canvas. Then there is the uh, sealing of the drawing through either um, a fixative that you put to seal the drawing. And then you go ahead and do your sepia drawing to get your tones, your values, your mids, your darks and your lights all situated in one color. And then after that's all uh, titled uh, or tight and situated, you uh, use a liquid or uh, some part part about the process where you, uh, you start putting the color onto the painting. So that was kind of where I started to understand a little bit of that painting oil process. Um, and it was a lot of disfiguration that was happening, very tight, very, very rigid um, form. So I guess, you know, because of life drawing being a, a place of knowing how to place anatomy. And, and, and so over the years, maybe fast forward after I graduated in 2015, I was, I was searching for something. I was looking for something that was, I believed promised to me after I graduated from my undergrad, you know, as a, as a young student, you think that the world is yours and you have every right to believe that. Um, but then you get humbled very quick that, you know, the work is just starting even then, you know, as a young kid getting your degree, the world is just starting for you. and the work for you isn't it just starting. And the road ahead is very, is very uh, rigorous. Um, and so LA wasn't working for me. So I believe that in 2016 or so, I made an effort to change my situation, change where I was at because LA just wasn't working for me. I was too comfortable. So I decided to uh, challenge myself and apply to a master's program at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. And so I ended up telling my parents that, hey, you know, I want to apply to this master's program. And it's uh, in New York, Brooklyn. And they're, they're like, oh my God, are you, are you sure you want to do this? And I was very, very sure. And it was the first time in my life, oddly enough, where I was very, very sure that of something. And I knew that I was going to get it. Um, and so I'm very grateful for that, very, that transformation. So when I, when, I, when I came to New York, I was, I was, I was very startled by the energy of, of, the, of the city. And, you know, so I wanted to kind of pull us to Romare Bearden's um, collage, which is one of my favorite works uh, actually by the artist. This is called The Dove, and it's made in 1964. And something about this piece in particular um, just reminds me of Harlem, reminds me of New York City. And in my case, where I lived when, I'm, when I landed in New York, it was, it was Bedstein. So for me, you know, this piece reminded me of Bedstein, the people and the landscape of what I'm seeing. It's here in this energy of this contained rectangle. And the very interesting thing about um, the Romare Bearden is that not only was he an artist, but he was a mathematician. He had a very keen sense of space and mathematics. And so as you can see from this piece, that every quadrant is called for and there's dynamic symmetry and dynamics happening every quadrant. Everything is counted for and everything is equal. And I find that very interesting in, in composing space within a fixed space of a, say, a canvas, a square or a rectangle. Um, so I, I find that very interesting um, from Romare. And, and so when I was a student, I, I kind of wanted to take that energy of what I was feeling of this fragmented of, you know, this energy of the walls speaking to me of, of palimpsests of graffiti and, and newsprint and the way in which you're standing at a subway station and you can see years, years old of, of paint flakes coming from the subway. And, you know, that energy, that, that grand entropy of, I guess, what you can say if the city of New York is or any urban city is, you can feel that so much. And I felt it. And it put a, uh, an everlasting effect on me and the work. Um, and so my first year, I, I was doing a lot of walking around, a lot of searching, a lot of looking up down underneath my shoe and around the corner, just, you know, from our surroundings, but also just so much sensory was happening. 
And what I started to understand and what I started to pay attention to was the textures and the surfaces that are in the city and how I feel that when I want to go to the studio and I, and I want to use paint as a material, I'm conflicted with the normal ways in which I was known to make marks, known to apply paint through the horizontal and the vertical application of a brush. But when I see this, when I see just the raw paint, corrosion, erosion, history, entropy, I, I feel something. I feel something more real than, than, than anything. And so when I go to the studio, I feel, I feel called to respond to paint in that way, viscerally. Um, and tactile, uh, tactile in, a, in a way that I uh, can feel and see and smell the paint. And so I get interested in that and that gets me really excited. So my investigations early on kind of when, how can I replicate this, this feeling of texture and erosion and entropy that the city does? And so um, when I was doing that, it, it was a lot of this slow, slow, uh, documentation of what's happening in the city. And I was doing a lot of these walks again and again. I would say the walking practice for me was a very important practice to, to embody in my, in my practice because it, it, it enlists some of these ideas of hospitality to a space. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Jacques Derda taught something a little bit about, uh, about the hospitality in a way in which when you're in a neutral space, how do we engage in this new arena that we're in? Um, and so I kind of wanted to take slow patience with what I'm doing with my interests. And I did not want to uh, fetishize and I don't want to put any, um, I guess, perspective that's not my own onto what I'm seeing. So when I was first, uh, Walking around, I linked it with my friend, Yusuf uh, Hassan, who now is a publisher at Black Mass. Um, we ended up having several studio conversations that were very beneficial for me as a young student. And we ended up taking walks to the West Fourth Courts in New York City, where I was watching a pickup pick game of these fellows, um, you know, playing at this historic New York court. I hadn't never been there before. So I was grabbing some video and, you know, it was like a four minute video and it ended up in this one character coming out from the side of the frame and he was covered in the silhouette of the sun and the shadows of the trees. And you could just see him winding up for like this, this dunk with great ease, with so much air underneath his feet that it literally believed like he could fly. And it reminded me so much of uh, the opening scene of Space Jam where Michael Jordan's dad said, uh, you know, he can do anything. And he believed that he could do anything. Yeah. And, and, and so my first week seeing this, I guess, apparition of that thought of that movie, it kind of enlisted in me that, hey, I can be here in the city to do anything. And it gave me confidence to try new things that I wasn't uh, used to in my practice. Yeah, and I think that's so amazing, thinking about how you, how you said how you came to, to art and creativity as a person that was really asking questions. Um, yeah. You know, something like PBS and, and Discovery Kids, I remember watching things like that. Um, and it, it being this really crazy introduction to the idea of like anthropology for a little kid, like exploring worlds and exploring these different things. Um, and the journey from Los Angeles to New York as a person that's, you know, you, you, LA wasn't working for you, like you said. No. That's so important to explore. And I, I mentioned this to you when we were speaking before, looking at your work in the way that it turns a lens to the world around it. Uh, it yeah. makes so much sense. So I love that you are telling this specific story and sharing this image. I just wanted to kind of throw that in there, but feel free to continue. You know, this is the first time I think I've, I've brought this image and I've, I think I've told, told the story. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, you know, I, I think, I think just seeing the world in a different way, right? When you are, when you grow up in a place, you, you're used to the rules and the regulations and, and like the formalities of that geographical place. But then when you're, when you're in a new territory, you feel like this cowboy who just came into this saloon and you know, but you're the, you're the hot shot. And so like, you kind of, you kind of feel that way. You feel New York makes you feel that way. And, and, it, and it amplifies you. And 
you know? And so when I would go to the studio, I, you know, I'm, I'm picking up things. I was finding a lot of objects on the street. I was taking a lot of pictures of, 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 of people, of things, of just textures that excite me. And this piece in my, in my studio behind me is, is called, it's called The Hang Time, my brother. And it's literally an image transfer from that, those uh, three images that I just had in the, three, uh, the last slide of that boy winding up for a dunk in elevation. And, you know, so I felt like this idea of the word hang time with how easily you can be levitated from the air to go for this dunk. And then also the same capability in which hang time for hair has that same, uh, I guess, synonym meaning for certain cultures. Um, and so I was kind of playing around with the idea of, of, of sentence and syntax. Um, and so for this piece, this is a way in which I could kind of play with that through images. Um, and this piece is called uh, Fragment of the Head. And, and again, it, I was interested in the idea of history and idea of memory. And what, the one thing about memory and the subconscious that's very interesting is that when we try to recall memory, even though it's something that we hold fond in the back of our heads, when we try to recall that, that idea gets shifted, transformed, and molded into a different existence. So therefore, it gets further and further away from its original memory. And so, Calling upon those fragments and even thinking about those fragments, I think about time and memory being fragmented. How can we ever pull together a whole picture of our memories, of our thoughts? It's very difficult. At least I find it very difficult. And so how do I, how do I manifest that idea in an image? And so the early on, I was thinking about, okay, I'm going to actually fragment the body. I'm going to fragment the face. Uh, I'm going to give only parts of the face that are recognizable to its, uh, to, to who it might be through the identification of the fullness of the lips and maybe just the skin or maybe the softness of the jawline, maybe it's a feminine character. You know, so like just having these features that might pinpoint to something, but not necessarily the whole thing. And, you know, again, this is again, thinking about the fragments of you know, marble sculptures that are in the Met, like, and even the head of the Jasper, the Jasper head that's in the Met of the Fragment of the Queen that stems from ancient Egyptian times. It, it more or less kind of thinking about that historical uh, context and thinking about fragmentation in history. Yeah, definitely. I love this piece and I love how you apply techniques to it as well that speak to that idea. Yeah, and, and again, you can see in the back of this painting, the texture and even what's going on behind this figure is, is again trying to point at what I'm seeing on the street, what I'm seeing outside on the subway stations and the graffiti um, overpasses. You know, it's the, the idea of there once was something there, there's a trace there and there's a remnant still there. Yeah, there's a really interesting sense of, of movement and then the mark of your hand, I think that really speaks to that idea of graffiti in a really interesting way. Um, and I always think of those mediums as how explicitly they are tied to the idea of memory. Um, if, if, you, if you bomb something or you put something up, how long will it last? Um, and that's it. it, you know, and I've never seen graffiti culture up close as what you can see in New York City, you know what I'm saying? You would say the genesis of it is here. I'm not a graffiti, um, you know, tag, I don't really have, I don't have ties to that, but like the idea of these marks, like these alphabets, this language that, that I'm seeing that these calligraphic marks that I'm literally seeing on the side of my, on the streets every day, you know, the, I don't know what it means, but I'm so invigorated by the energy that they carry. And so when I am in, in the studio, I started incorporating spray paint. I started incorporating these marks. I started trying to move like the way in which I would know that marks are made on a street corner, left and then covered up, left again and then covered up. Yeah. yeah. I love that. I love that. And I, I love how, it's, how much that slow process that you mentioned, those walks, and then that studio time is so important. Uh, and, and like, yeah. it just moves differently in doing those kind of things. Even if you have and are afforded the time and the space, it's like there's a little bit of a sense of, Nobody walks anywhere. 
around, <laughs> around here and, and things like that, yeah. you know? So having that time and that space and all of these things, it's very interesting how all of this stuff is reflecting in the work that, that you're doing. So go ahead. Continue. Yeah, you know, and it's funny because I, I, I bring to New York the California sensibility of like, I'm chilling, I'm taking my time. But, you know, because I'm chilling, I'm taking my time with so much to see, I'm taking so much in and I have to process it slowly to make sense of it. So therefore the work and the ideas have to, have to slowly burn, slowly churn. Um, and then, and then like in New York also gives me the energy in which I can, you know, be, uh, break up, uh, break up the space and actually have energy onto the canvas. You know, I'm, I like, I like being able to, uh, respond to, to what's around me. And so I, I started, you know, picking around trash and palimpsests and debris from you know, the streets and the my own studio and started bringing them into the studio to make collages and, and works like this. Um, and these are the fun collages that, are, that happen through this idea of thinking about hospitality again. Uh, the walks comes from this class that I had taken in, 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 in Pratt. It's called Walkscapes. And it was a practice, it was a class based on the practice of just walking. Walking and being meditative and being reflective. After each walk, you ruminate about what you saw, the minute details, taking notice to the smell, the textures. If, if it rained that morning, you write that. You know, the little small things of what you take in could have so much poetic meaning. And I believe from the 1930s and 1920s of the Dadas is where these walkscapes, these, uh, these expeditions that could come about, that they would go out and um, go on these walks and they would take notes or they'll take photos of, of people, but not necessarily like portraits of people. They would take uh, photos of like either their hands, details of someone's jacket, like a button or socks of someone's shoe. But those elements then stood as like maybe an indirect portrait of that person. And so like the, and the daughters and Cyrillus had like this idea of kind of this pseudo hospitality that Derrida kind of speaks about. And so I kind of Giant, I kind of been joined too in my exploration of, of what excites me. And so these collages kind of speak to this idea of, you know, I'm walking, I'm walking, taking my time to either come from my apartment to go to my studio. And I'm, I'm finding these pieces of, piece of, uh, piece of paper. And then when I put them together, I can find these relationships that actually have these poetic meanings, you know, like they never really were intended to come together to be assembled in that way. But when the individual pieces come together, they form a sentence. You know, this piece to me is, is self-explanatory. It, it, it reads its own sentence, it creates its own sentence. And this is when I was living in bed -Stuy. And I wasn't there for too long, and I ended up moving to Ridgewood um, right after I had graduated. But around the time, I guess, my spring semester of my of my MFA, and uh, so around that time, my geographical uh, spot it changed, and I wasn't around so much of the normal things that I would find in Bed Stuy. I was in Ridgewood, and so I was a lot further than Bed Stuy. Um, and you know, so a lot of it, a lot of the work. Uh, was very influenced by my closeness to what I was getting in Best Eye through the West Africans, the Caribbeans, yeah. just off of the expanse of the diaspora kind of just being there, you know. And in LA, we have a lot of pockets of different people very spread out, um, and it's hard to kind of tap into. Um, but in New York, you, because it's so dense, we could co-mingle with so many different people on a daily basis. And from even there, I was learning so much. Um, this is an image from um, my solo, I guess, thesis presentation from my Pratt MFA, uh, MFA thesis. Um, and it was just called uh, Time to Contemplate Solids. Um, and so this was kind of like the summation of my two years at Pratt, of all that I was seeing, all that I had learned, and all that I was hoping to. I guess, make for the future, all that I was hoping to investigate. Um, and so you can see there were, you know, there are installations and sculpture and there's painting. 
And I was interested in all these materials uh, in, in which I was using clay and in which a lot of the, a lot of the piece in this middle, I guess that middle four piece, middle four uh, piece is a, is a confirmation, confirmation of uh, images and, 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 and picture frames and things that I found on the street. Yeah. And when I put them together, you know, it makes this, uh, makes this image and this uh, sculpture. I love that this work is a reflection of the various different locations that you were in during that really condensed period of, your, of time in your life, you know, like an MFA program. And I think for a lot of people, when you do that, you're just immersed in one community, in one location, uh, whether it be, you know, the group of people that are in your MFA group or the location of your program. And I think New York affords the ability to do that, but some people are not necessarily into that. Like some people, they think about it differently and they move in a different way. And I think for yourself and for a person that's thinking about this work in terms of asking questions, I think, just to take it back to how we started off, it's really important that you did have this kind of experience. Uh, you know, yeah. it reflects in those diverse works. And I, as a person who works with a lot of artists, sometimes I wonder when people make the move from being an oil painter to bringing in other things, um, which I, I kind of think artists can do whatever they want, but I just question when those things happen, what's the process? Like, I'm really excited about this. Um, and yeah. I, you're showing that, you're showing that process. So it makes sense that you have these things that you collected, the work that you worked in in your studio and this very slow process that all of this stuff comes together to make. Um, so I just wanted to add that in there. But. Thank you, thank you. And you know, it's the funny thing that like when you're, when you're making the work, when you're in real time, you really can't see the correlation. You really can't see like how that one thing might lead into what you're seeing now recording, you know, and, and that is because I'm, I'm rewinding back, I'm able to see this, the line of thought is kind of, is changing. Uh, but I mean, damn, I, I would definitely say if I didn't move to New York, it, it, I don't know where the work would have been. You know, I'm always asking questions. I think my curious mind always will, will always do that to me. You know, I'm always going to be curious. I'm always going to want to change things. I'm always going to want to, um, see what is next. Am I capable of blank? You know, and I think life can be a testament to that. I want my life to be a testament of can I do this next? I don't know. I'll see if I do it, you know. Yeah. But and so like when I see this, when I see this the show and it, it's a summation, it's a summation of my of my of my efforts to leave home, to, to come to New York and I, I have the physical thing right before me of all my sacrifices and it feels good. Um, and because of this show, um, I was able to then leave to go on to my solo show with uh, Rick um, at residency in Inglewood. He was somebody who I've known for years and he's actually helped me a long, a long time um, before my career had taken off. Um, and, you know, Rick Garzen, he, he has a space that uh, that he curated a show called The New Contemporaries and he brought together a group of contemporary artists who we now know. Um, but he had this particular eye that is just so like great and I, I, I owe a lot to him and his uh, uh, support. And so I ended up going to make the show with him uh, in September of 2019. Uh, and at the time, I didn't have a studio space so that was like kind of the thing up in the air it was kind of a big question mark where was i going to land and months and months were happening and it's uh july and i'm getting kind of nervous i don't have a space and not much of the work is made and the show's in september uh so i decide to go back home and i say shoot i'm just going to go ahead and do what i did before and just paint my room paint my backyard um, but luckily, um, there was an alternative plan in which one of my friends, one of my great friends, Eileen Ixelmena, um, who was working with Zeal, the residency, um, she told me that, hey, you know, I, I'm working with this residency who's starting this incubator period of this space in Inglewood. Would you be mining, you know, would you mind actually using the space? You know, we can maybe jumpstart this residency by, by having you in the space. And I said, well, sure, <laughs> why not? And, and so the, the old space in Inglewood was Todd Gray's old um, space in which now Alan Freepong, Walter Cruz, and a number of other individuals, including Eileen Itzelmena, are on the Zeal team now with this residency in Inglewood. 
Um, so I spent about two months there um, where I was making the work for um, the atmosphere of certain uncertainty. And this work was kind of responding to the reading I was doing on Franz Fanon's Black Skin, White Masks. And when I was, when I was reading uh, a lot of what he was trying to discuss about how the psychology of the Black male is, is always kind of seen as being this horrific monster, I, I kind of wanted to pick out certain points of what he was uh, discussing. And I, I think the main crux of what I was getting out of out of Fanon's words was, you know, the idea of simulation, what we walk into, and what that perspective is thrusted onto us. It's an un, uh, it's a thing that we don't necessarily want, but we walk into it every single day. And similarly to these masks that we might put on, these you know, spatial frontal masks, I would take the metaphor and ex and ex and I wanted to stretch it out by saying that shoot maybe. Two uh, suit socks, socks that we physically put on every day, and we go out to the world and we walk with this idea of we having to deal with a simulation, having to deal with the social um, precepts that are forced upon our bodies. That these are the things that we have to walk in every day. But then again, like this contract of that white against the black skin is is that that guess uh, that dual consciousness that you that W. E. Du Bois can even. Uh, mentioned. And so I was playing with a lot of these ideas in which um, the physicality of legs and suit socks would represent. And it's a series that was, um, you know, kind of uh, planning on trying not to make the words of Fanon seem so clinical, but kind of actually seem a little bit more real by it being, say, your cousin or yourself, you know, putting on your socks, putting on your slides, running over to the corner store, you know. I wanted to make those things very personable. Um, and so that was a little bit of what I was thinking about in this, in this series. Yeah, I love that. I love this idea of making Fanon less clinical. I think I sometimes struggled with the work when I first was, when it was first presented to me uh, by a professor. I studied uh, English literature and various different forms of literature in school, so I have my degree in. Um, and I, I never thought about it in the way that you just said, making it about this lived experience, I think, is essentially what you're saying, right? Like, you know, throwing on your tube socks, throwing on the slides and, and living and what that means and, mm -hmm. and all the different forms that that, that that comes in, which I think that this work reflects that really beautifully as well, um, the sense of movement. And yeah, you're just, you just really like put something in, in beautiful words for me that I, I was struggling with that work, like when, I was, when it was first presented to me, because I'm like, I hear this, yeah, it, but it's not necessarily like what I am personally going through or what a lot of people in my community go through all the time. It it, it comes in a different form. Exactly. Right? It, it comes, it shows up in the, in the French Mozambique form to the colonizer or colon, a, a colonizer. But for us, who is the colonizer and who are we, I guess, performing underneath? Um, you know, and so I kind of wanted to like transform those ideas and say, all right, how, how is this actually manifest in my life? Because yeah, it is very clinical, but I also was very aware that the audience that I'm talking to doesn't have the same clinical background in PhDs that some people might know that can, you know, dismantle the, the words of Franz Fanon. So if I'm an artist and my idea in my my I would say that my uh, mission is to disseminate these ideas in which the public can understand and see themselves in. And so I felt like this work was an attempt to do that. Yeah, and just really quickly, I will add that in thinking about all of that, it's really important that community is, is a part of that. Like, it's hard to do that on your own. It's, you need certain people. So it's really beautiful for you to bring up people like Eileen and Rick and, and their role in this experience as well. Um, I'm so familiar with both of the, both of their work on so many levels. And it's like, you know, I love when people, when I have the opportunity to talk to an artist and they bring those sorts of things into this conversation. Um, mm -hmm. And it's so much reflecting of, of what you're talking about. So we, we have to give rise. We have to give, uh, we have to give way to the people who who made us, you know, and people who helped us on the journey. You know, I did not just arise from the soil overnight. You know, I, was watered and I was given sunlight and I was given nutrients through my environment. 
And, you know, people that I meet and the people that I have met, uh, I'm a product of my interactions with them. Yeah. And so, I, you know, I, I do want to give my time and my space to, to give my, my people some flowers, for sure. Feel that. Um, so, yeah, and, and sorry, but, but moving on. Um, yeah, and this is a little bit some of the work from the, uh, the show, Installation Shot of Side. And, um, and then moving on to this, it was an interesting kind of point in my life where I had was celebrating off the reels of, of, of having a very successful show at residency with uh, Rick Garza. But all about, during that time, um, I had linked up with Nicky Dean Gallery um, in Los Angeles. So my show at residency had closed and I had linked up with uh, residency for sorry, um, Nicky Dean for my solo show. And I had been working with Nicky Dean um, in the months prior, even when I was in my MFA, um, they were able to show some of my works um, actually that I had shown in my MFA thesis in some group shows. Um, and so the relationship from then was, uh, it, it kept on continuing. And so we, I was offered a solo show in February, I believe it was February 8th. So I had just finished my show in September and I had to then to now prepare for a show in February um, and for a bigger space, a space that was far larger than I could ever see myself filling. Um, you know, I would, I would say I would need to practice for something like that, but I guess this, this real time of, of learning on the job thing is, is the practice. Yeah. Um, it, and so during the, those four months, I really had to channel a lot of, of uh, a lot of different things out of myself that I wasn't necessarily called to do before. Um, I made about, I believe, 14 works in total in the span of four months, and all of which are bigger sizes that I've ever worked with. Um, and with a medium, that is very difficult. Um, and so, you know, it was a very, it was a feat that I'm, I congratulate myself on, but I believe that because I know myself and I know I need time, I know I need things to marinate, that this, that this high fast of making was almost like these gym reps at, you know, at the gym where you're just feverishly getting these weights in and these reps in to get stronger. And so by the time I was making this work, my skill set sharpened, it got stronger, it got sharp, it got stronger. And I was able to see myself making paintings a little bit more complex than I had seen myself making before. I started wanting to try new things as far as my technique. I started wanting to incorporate um, more of a visual space um, for the viewer. And how was I going to achieve that? So I, I, I was just learning how to contain and how to fill a space. Um, this painting is uh, 70 by 80 inches, so it's a fairly large piece. And, you know, the, the, the subject that you see fairly takes up a lot, a lot of the real estate of, of the canvas. Um, but in, in between the figure and the, the real estate of the canvas and what you're seeing, I wanted the paint to really have a lot of expression, a lot of movement. So this piece took me uh, about a few months to kind of conceptualize and get through. But I would say I learned a great deal. It was one of my turning point pieces. Um, this piece is called Black Madonna. And this is oil, oil stick and spray paint on linen. Yeah, I love it. I, the, the paint does have a lot of movement, like, like you said. And I love how you stepped up to the challenge. <laughs> how you, you know, you have this pressure of having back-to-back -back shows and all the different things that that entails on, on such a deep level. Uh, but still thinking about the work and thinking about how your actual practice as an artist is going to evolve. That's really interesting, especially thinking about, you know, a few months prior than that, you were like, where am I actually going to make work at? <laughs> like, yeah. how am I going to make it? Um, so that was another thing that I think we talked about very early on when I, when I talked to you and asked you to come and do this program is that I really wanted to talk about how I see as a really rapid rise in your practice and the work that, that you're doing, especially as a person that followed your work from before you even went to Pratt. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, I, I love that. And I love this work as well. I think it is a turning point in your work. And go, go ahead, proceed. No, thank you. Thank you. It, and so that was, that was uh, November 2019. 
when I, I, I believe I started this work. Um, and yeah, and I had a lot of questions then, you know, and I find myself year in year kind of building off where I was last year, as we always should, right? We should always continue to progress and, and be uncomfortable in the face of progression. Um, and and I'm, I welcome that because I know that if I'm uncomfortable now, I'm not going to be comfortable. I'm not going to be uncomfortable forever. I'm going to be, I'm going to have that much, uh, I'm going to have that tool set on my, on my belt. And so I learned a lot with this and I, and I took, I took some of that with me when I wanted to go to um, my residency. I'm at Black Rock Synagogue. And because everything was moving so fast, I, you know, I graduated in my MFA program in June of 2019, had my first solo show with residency that following September. And then my solo show, my first solo show with my now representation um, in uh, February. So it, it was back to back like no other. Um, but then when I went to Senegal, it was a, it was a different pace. And again, I, I'd gotten there at March uh, 1st. And so the pandemic was starting to brew into what we are now in right now. So I was flying right when the beginning of COVID news was kind of happening. It was very, very scary. Um, and so I, I arrived um, March 2nd after 24 hours of flying. <laughs> um, and I was welcomed to a few drinks and a few food laying around on some tables and uh, lying around these couches around that food and, and those drinks were Kehinde Wiley and a few of the residents of the Black Rock Synagogue that I was going to actually stay four months with, um, little did I know. Um, and I was supposed to be there for two months and I ended up being there for about four months. Um, and as you can see, you know, I'm, I'm, my hair is shaved, but I, I had dreads then. So there was a lot, a lot has changed, but that is me and that is a uh, Zora Akaporo. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm not even gonna say her last name because I'm gonna butcher the last name. But her name is Zoro, Zora, and this is Kalechi. Um, and they're brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, I love them so much and we had a great time in Senegal, even though we had to learn about the, you know, how to maneuver during the COVID, we, we had a great time there. Yeah, and, that's an unexpected thing. I love this photo. That's a good photo. And that doesn't even, you look like a different person. Like I'm a whole different person, yeah. Which uh, I feel like if you look at any, a picture of a lot of people a year ago, they look like, or a couple of years ago, they look like a different I mean, person. yeah, this, this is different. That you, This year, you could just, you could just see that how much, uh, I wouldn't necessarily, I would, maybe I would say trauma. I would, I would say we experienced a lot of grief, trauma, a lot of, uh, anxiety collectively right and I, and I think we've shared that um I, be, I believe in the beginning months even here when i was in senegal i was in a different country and, and seeing what was going on at, back home and that was very scary and everyone who was there at the residency equally too were not at home and they were very scared and they're away from their family and friends and so we had time to kind of console each other in that time um, and be there for each other, which was very grateful. You know, I was really grateful for their company. That's great. Um, one, of, one of the things that was really difficult that I found out was that uh, when, I moved, when I went to Senegal, that the resources was just the thing that I had to figure out. Like what was available to me in the state is not gonna be available to me in a different country. And to have that put in perspective for me as someone early in my practice, um, it, it tells me that, you know, don't get used to certain things and that your work can always change and the, and the practice can always change based on what is given to you. And, and so when I was at this store, this linen store, a lot of the trial and error that I was facing was trying to find the right linen, the linen that would actually stretch uh, with my rabbit skin glue. And I went through a lot of different, um, different fabric stores and I went through a lot of different grades of linen, um, but I ended up going to this fabric store, which is one of my favorite ones. Um, and I believe like that stack to the left of the screen is the linen that I would choose from, that stack. Um, and the only had, I think that stack of linen was only maybe 50, 
maybe 60 inches, inches across or so. So I didn't really have a lot to, uh, to work with. So I ended up trying to sew my canvases at some times. Um, Black Rock was like just was super beautiful. It, uh, you know, the shoreline was right there outside of the residence. You wake up, you go to your window, and you can look down to the shoreline of the Atlantic, and and you get to see the rocks. And it was it was just really beautiful. Um, and so March fourth was my birthday out there, and I, I turned twenty eight. And and luckily I was able to go to Gory Island, which is the place where the enslaved people were taken and then um, shipped to the various countries of the world. I was there on my birthday to see the door of no return. And that was the last day that I was able to go anywhere publicly. But it was a very powerful day where I spent the day with a few of my friends there. And we met some of the locals there who are artists there on the, on the island, some of which work with sand um, and some of our, our musicians. Um, but they live on this hill underneath all these beautiful rocks. But this island, this chunk of land that is, I mean, for Americans, maybe for the Senegalese there too, it's riddled with how we became. It's riddled with our origins. And they're just sitting on this, this rock. And it just felt really interesting. And the, and the rocks are just boring, you know, kind of borderline this, this, the car Senegal. And so when I was making work, I was kind of responding again to the landscape. I, I wanted to think about what is my, how am I taking in what I'm seeing? Um, I don't speak the language, which is French and the native tongue well off. So I'm really kind of here for, with my observations and my patience with what I'm seeing with this new space, the hospitality again. And I really believe these rocks, um, because it is on the Atlantic Ocean, they, they serve as these totemic structures even of all the spirits and all the people and all the energies that have been casted or even lost away at the sea, even at the Atlantic Ocean, um, in which we travel from the Atlantic into the Pacific. Um, and so I make this work called the rocks took a hold of my soul. And this is a, a work that is 60 by 62 inches. Um, and at the top of the canvas, you can see there's like a, there's a seam line um, at the top where I've, I've managed to kind of sew two linen scraps of uh, canvas I had. And I sewed them together to elongate it. But it actually made like this interesting textural, you know, division. And also, I just really liked how that, how that looked as a means of you know, necessity. Um, but I, I believe this, this, this figure walking on the rocks as, you know, again, trying to capture a movement that is, that is walking off screen, a movement that is possibly continuous, um, maybe walking along these rocks. Um, and you know, I, I, feel, I just feel like this image for me um, just kind of encapsulates what I felt from, from Senegal. And this image is, it's something that I, I found online. It's a stock image, but I like to go into Photoshop a lot of time in my in my practice, and I take a lot of my images, my found images, or things that I find online, and I put them into my digital um, applications, and I make different collages. I either um, rearrange things, um, see different colors from which I can apply from the canvas. It, it, it serves as my reference. But what becomes really interesting in the painting process is necessarily the, the, the improvisation of, I guess you could say, the sheet music to then the in-between notes of what an improvised freestyle would be from a trumpet player. I, I like to think of my references as being, again, the sheet music, a structure. But since I know a structure, um, I can then break it apart. I can then fragment it again and bring parts of it to make a whole. It's kind of bringing together that the whole is pretty much the sum of its parts. And if I make this, if I make the whole out of interesting parts as individual interesting parts, that the sum of the whole is going to be all interesting. Yeah. All in the day. 
And, and that's, really, that's really great considering what you were saying about that class you took at, at Channel Islands, that first class where, where you had to paint like a cross section or think about it that way. Yes. Um, when I look at your work, I'm always just like, he's a master of so many different techniques and really thinking about, about that. Um, and for me, it, it kind of does go back to that. Um, it goes back to those very fundamental ideas of, you know, I, I hate to say that people need training or that people need school or something like that. The more I engage with, with art, I'm just like, there's so many different entry points into this, right? But then there is a case to make for people having that sort of thing and thinking about it in that manner, at least, even if you are going to paint in your room or paint in your backyard, like you were saying. Um, and I think your all of your work really reflects that. It really reflects like how you're looking through a certain lens, even if it is a cross section. And this image is really interesting. And like thinking about what you said about it being a stock image as well, and you jumping into Photoshop, I think that that's really, really important. Um, and I can see where you kind of stitch together the two canvases as well. So that's like even another layer of that whole conversation of, you know, how all the different sums come together to make the whole. Exactly. And, and, you're, and you're right, you know, like, we, the thing about me, like, I, I love painting, you know, and I, I'm very interested in the Italian Renaissance. I'm very interested in great painters like, you know, Goya. I'm very interested in Pierre Bernard, Edward Bouillard. I'm interested in painters. You know, I'm an oil painter in, you know, I'm inserted in that history. I may look a specific way. I may look a, a different way in which that history may be written, you know, but then I'm, I still, I still mind my placement in it. And so as a painter working in contemporary times, um, with having training in, you know, various techniques, how do I either, um, I would say, put a comma on what happened and then continue the sentence? Um, but, the, but how then can I, you know, add to what I was influenced by? And so I'm always trying to figure out how I can bridge my intersection of how I see was based on what I was taught, the history, mining the history. And now say my intersection is just based on what I'm observing. And you know, my day to day, because of New York City being what it is, I'm seeing this. Um, you know, I'm seeing the palisades of newsprint and graffiti, and again, like you said, these marks, these, this language that's happening. Um, and something very interesting happened, right? Where when I was in Senegal, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, those things were happening as well as the violence against the trans brothers and sisters across the nation. Those things were happening. And I come back to New York with boarded up restaurants and plywood storefronts, and you can't go inside anywhere. So I'm even more so based, I'm banked on the periphery of, of society even more, where we kind of have to walk, stay outside, then if you're outside, what are you going to do? You're going to pay attention to what's around you. So I can take more inventory of what is around me. And so when I'm walking, this is, this is what I'm seeing. I can't go inside. I'm seeing a lot of graffiti. I'm seeing a lot of these marks. But then again, I'm minding this history that I that I that I that I am coming from as an oil painter. This image right here I'm about to pull up is a is a by uh, Peter Paul Rubens study uh, four studies of a uh, head of a moor. This is painting made in 1614. Um, you know, and again, this is this is as painter as you can get, like old masters painting the drawing the underpainting, it's just got all qualities of a master. But then my intersection is a painter who understands, um, you know, the, the traditional side of painting. I wanted to go in and have, again, that comma. So this is Peter Paul Rubin's um, studies of a forehead of a moor. I said, I said, what have I made the, uh, the four studies women? acquire a scene of women, choir, soprano, alto coming together in a mass, like these four studies of the head of a more, but then flipping the gender, but then also kind of making it personalized in the point in which I remember scenes in which my dad was a choir um, music director or even a organ uh, director for 
Baptist church on Sundays and Monday, Wednesday nights. And so, so I bring back a little bit of part of that memory that comes from such a long time ago, from when I was nine, eight. I can recall back that memory of seeing my Nana and her friends singing belting soprano notes in the choir. But then I see this image, again, I'm responding to a stock image that I see online of the choir. I then get, I get struck with the string of nostalgia that then brings me back to a place that was very familiar. My Nana singing in the choir, my dad playing the piano, doing choir rehearsal on Wednesday nights. That's my intersection of, 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 of life, my experiences, but I know how to use paint in a specific way. And so again, with all that I've come to the table with, time, memory, movement, and also my idea of knowing how paint works, my investigation of how paint works, this painting in particular, um, it, it exercises the different ways in which the materiality of paint can exist. It can be drippy, it can be pulled, it can be thick, it can be thin, it can have translucency. And I wanted to play with all the characteristics. They're like notes, they're like chords, they're like, you know, full phrases of music. And I wanted the painting to be thought of and composed of and thought of like music, movement, visual movement. Um, so the work goes through all these different types of passes, um, interventions, like you would see in a New York subway station or the street. Um, putting newsprint on the bottom of, of the canvas, ripping it off. That's the thing I learned from Mike Bradford, you know. But there's this, there's, you know, but it's this idea of, of, of looking and an idea of mark making, this idea of physicality, this idea of how do I put all that I'm emotionally embodying and really release this naturally and raw? This is my attempt to really capture this, this, this thing that we were imposed, um, you know, that was imposed on us, where we are forced to be on the periphery of things. Things are degraded, things are eroded, things are closed up. Time has kind of won a little bit over the landscape. Um, so let me kind of put that in the in the visual uh, realm. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about Nina Simone's quote where a lot of great artists should always respond to the times. And I think about it all the time. And I wanted, I wanted to really challenge myself to how can I be true to myself? How can I be honest? But how can I speak to the times? How can I speak to what's happening, not only in history, but in the art market, in my practice, at the world at large, what I'm doing, how do I challenge these things? And I'm always trying to be an instrument of recognizing that there's things to be challenged, but I want to be honest within myself um, and to just forwardly move honest. And that's all I could ever hope for. Um, and I, I know this new body of work for me is, you know, it's me moving honest. Um, and I'm really excited for the next body of work to come from this because I've learned so much over the course of the year. Time has been its greatest teacher, but time has also been my greatest friend because it's one of the mediums that I love so much is just as much as paint. I've learned to use time. I have learned to let time be on my side in order to really exercise what I love so much about paint. Yeah, and I feel like that's really amazing, right? In, in terms of thinking about time and the, the various different things that you can build and you mentioned to me before this idea of like alchemy um, and how important that is to your work. And I think to see the work and to see, you know, some of those early works, you were definitely already in the realm of abstraction. You were already there. Uh, but now how much this past year and this experience has tasked you with thinking about that in the work that you're, that you're making. Um, and I remember when I saw this work, I think I came across it, I was doing freeze. Um, with this work was a part of your freeze presentation. It was, yeah, this, this is currently, it was currently, um, it was the, for the freeze presentation, but it's also gonna be a physical um, show shown at Bucharest, my gallery, Nicodine. Great, I mean, I'm definitely not gonna be able to make it to Bucharest, but one right. of the things <laughs> I was thinking, when I saw this work, it's like, man, like I, I'm a person that I, I think there's a ton of 
necessity and th great things that can happen from seeing work online digitally. But when I saw this, I was like, I need to see this in person. I need to see the techniques. I need to see everything that's applied because I think, you know, having followed your work for so long, I can see the natural progression, but also this was like a little bit different. Like it's totally unexpected. Um, and I think I really like that because of all yeah. the things that you're doing and I can see the figures there in the background and they're still very much a, a part of what's going on. Um, but it's just really interesting to see it in process and then how it's, it's turned on its side. It's not the way that you expected to be presented in the space and, and all of this stuff. I think the time that you have been afforded over this year, uh, which is something I think that we all have been thinking about. I'm thinking about it a little bit myself. It's just like, it's so great sometimes that things move so slow, but also we're, everybody's forced to be doing that right now. You know, mm -hmm. things still close down, even if it seems like things are opening up and, and stuff is changing. Um, I think you make a really good case for kind of just living in that and seeing what can happen if, if you just, you know, let things go in a way. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to see in the future where you take this kind of work and, and, you know, what else you will do with the time that you've been afforded, I guess. Thank you, man. Thank you. It's, it's been a, it's been an interesting ride, but I would just say, you know, as a thing to say to young artists out there who are possibly listening, um, you know, this is your practice. This is your love, love it, cherish it, protect it. Um, and make sure that you're moving honestly and you're moving with the intent of your heart. That's all I have to say. I love it. I love it. Yeah, man. Thanks a lot, David. Thank you so much, Joshua.